Today on Pirate TV, we're talking with our old friend, S. Brian Wilson. And uh, Brian was, was conscripted into the military from graduate school in 1966, and by 1969 was commander of a USAF combat security unit in Vietnam, where he personally witnessed atrocities that altered his life forever. A trained lawyer and criminologist and one time member of the Washington DC bar. He has been an advocate for prisoners, Vietnam veterans and impoverished people around the world striving for justice. As an activist, he has been a conscientious tax refuser, participated in water only fasts and various civil disobedience actions and led delegations documenting the US aggressions in a number of countries. As a result of a lengthy veterans fast in 1986, he and other fasters were identified as domestic terrorist suspects. One year later, on September 1st, 1987, while engaging in a well-publicized blockade, protesting weapons shipments to El Salvador and Nicaragua, he was run over and nearly killed by a U.S. government munitions train, accelerating to three times its five mile per hour limit causing severe head injuries and the loss of both legs. Brian is the author of several books, including Blood on the Tracks. Brian now lives in Nicaragua. So how long have you been living in Nicaragua? Five years. Uh, the purpose of this show today is I wanted to talk to you about the elections in Nicaragua. Right. And uh, this was surrounded and preceded by nonstop false claims and meddling by the U.S. administration. But you'd never know it if you watched the corporate media here. You certainly and wouldn't. This is not only in the United States, but also Europe and elsewhere. <laughs> and uh, even Al Jazeera, you know. Yeah. So uh, pretty amazing. The Sandinistas or um, FSLN <laughs> won overwhelmingly. The US, EU, and OAS have refused to recognize the results. And on November 10th, President Biden signed the Renaissance Act, which will impose more crushing sanctions on Nicaragua. The main accusations, and this stems from the New York Times, which didn't even have a reporter the, there. The, news, the, the newspaper that has all the news. The yeah. Print. Yeah. Uh, this is number one, the government banned the opposition parties and imprisoned opposition candidates. Two, the voter turnout was negligible and there were no foreign electoral observers and Nicaragua barred parties from holding large public rallies. And uh, so it doesn't take a lot of checking to find out that none of this was actually true. And since you're now living in Nicaragua, I, I thought, you know, there probably isn't a better person that I could talk to than you since you witnessed all of this. With uh, disgust. Yeah. I mean, I was constantly disgusted about how the media covers Nicaragua, which is the most interesting progressive country in Latin America by far. You've been writing about this, too, on Facebook yeah. a lot. And it's yeah, really on, good. On, on Facebook. Yeah, the sur surveillance capitalism, I just take advantage of it. So it occurred to me that, you know, we could take each one of these false narratives and uh, basically voice them on their own petard. Maybe you can kind of give us an overview of like uh, the U.S. meddling in Nicaragua and what this Renaissance Act actually is. Well, the Renaissance Act <coughs> is a follow up to the NICA Act, which was passed in 2018, which imposes a lot of sanctions on Nicaragua that makes it harder to get loans uh, and to do business on the, uh, internationally. But the Renaissance Act actually adds more sanctions and specifically identifies a number of Sandinista government officials to be specifically sanctioned. Uh, I'm not sure, I'm not sure just what the practical ramifications of that are, but I know that uh, in Nicaragua, uh, they, they're they used to being persecuted by the U.S. and they always find ways around it or they find ways to survive because they have so much support here. Despite the U.S. saying that Nicaragua poses a, a, an emergency, a, a national emergency threat to the United States, uh, I mean, it's, it's just, a, it, 
It's such a joke. Uh, I can't believe that these people went to college that, that, that are in government. I mean, they, they're stooges. They remind me of the three stooges that I used to like to watch when I was a kid and, uh, at the movie theater. They're, they're really, they really are atrocious. I mean, they really are pathetic. And they have all this power that the American North, that the U.S. people give them, and they don't hit the streets and they don't block entrances and they, they uh, sanction by their silence or by their uh, continued lifestyles, even if they're not that lucrative lifestyles. The system just goes on and on and on and on uh, with impunity and basically committing ecocide on the planet. I mean, it's, 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 it, it, it's beyond my capacity to comprehend and articulate it, how absolutely psychotic it is. Yeah. I don't have the language for it. It's, these, if, these, if the United States was a person, that person would be locked up for life in a mental hospital uh, in a maximum security ward for being danger to the, to the society. Uh, but it's, it's a nation state. And uh, as long as the people don't revolt, uh, it continues ad infinitum. Well, it's, it's always been there. We were talking earlier about uh, John Stockwell and, you know, how that, you know, he talked about how that they planted black propaganda yeah. in the media when he was running the war in Angola, you know, right. and that was back in the 60s. Right. So it's, I think it's, and then, you know, uh, I've been broadcasting the uh, Cold War Truth Commission, and uh, and they're talking about it all the whole Cold War and the Cold War propaganda, right? And so last yeah, week I, I grew was... up with it. My my family always, which was a Christian family, a devout Christian family, said a prayer at every meal at, at supper time, and they always thanked the Lord for J. Edgar Hoover. For protecting us from communism. Yeah. I heard that every night. <laughs> so I wanted to play this clip, you know, from uh, Jeff Cohen. You know, so Jeff Cohen, you know, I always knew him as the founder of FAIR, yeah. you know, yeah. Fairness and Accuracy and Reporting. And, uh, but I didn't know that he was the senior producer on the Donahue show. And so, uh, you know, we're talking about the corporate media, how that they all jumped on this story and they're all like birds on a wire. Right. And so this clip here from him kind of lays all that out. The Cold War continued to narrow the political spectrum uh, and who's allowed into the d debate long after the Soviet Union collapsed. I could still feel the Cold War's impact in 2002 and 2003 when I was working at MSNBC run by NBC News and a new war against Iraq was being cranked up. And I was the senior producer, as, as Frank said, on the most watched program on MSNBC, the Phil Donahue primetime show. And I wanna end my remarks by talking about what I witnessed during that period. One night we booked uh, Ramsey Clark, the former U.S. Attorney General who talked eloquently against this push to invade Iraq. And the next morning, we learned from management how we had screwed up, that Ramsey Clark is not supposed to appear on MSNBC. Uh, this is nearly 50 years after Joe McCarthy and there was some sort of blacklist that no one had told us about. And we'd made the mistake of booking Ramsey Clark. Management warned us repeatedly that Phil Donahue was coming across to viewers as un-American and they actually used that word. As the Iraq invasion grew closer, management took over the Phil Donahue show and they imposed a quota system. They said, if we wanted to book one guest who was opposed to the push toward an invasion of Iraq. We had to have two guests that were pro-invasion. If we booked two guests on the left, we had to have three guests on the right. At one meeting, a producer said, I think I could book Michael Moore for Thursday. And Michael was known 
as a serious critic of the push toward invading Iraq. And the producer was told, you'll have to have three right wingers for ideological balance. I thought privately about proposing Noam Chomsky as a guest, but you can imagine the problem. Our stage couldn't accommodate the 28 right wingers we would have needed for ideological balance. 10 days after the biggest peace demonstrations in global history, MSNBC canceled the Donahue show for purely political reasons. Did management say, wow, look at the size of these demonstrations. If we unleash Phil Donahue, we're going to have a huge audience. No. For political reasons, they terminated our show. How do I know it was political? Well, memos started leaking out from NBC News. And one of the memos worried that Donahue would be, quote, a home for the liberal anti-war agenda at the same time that our competitors are waving the flag at every opportunity, unquote. That memo asserted that Donahue represents, quote, a difficult face for NBC News in a time of war. So Donahue primetime was canceled by MSNBC three weeks before the invasion of Iraq. And a few days before we were canceled, something weird happened. MSNBC announced that they were hiring someone new to host a new program. And the person they were hiring was the far right racist radio talk show host, Michael Savage. So there it is. <laughs> that's pretty, that's, 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 that's great evidence. Yeah. So at any rate, uh, let's, let's take these, uh, this narrative one at a time here. You know, the accusations from the New York Times, which actually were echoed all over the world by all the corporate media. Nicaragua barred parties from holding large public rallies. It's a pandemic, right? I don't think even think uh, all, all our, I mean, the Sandinistas didn't have any large rallies either because uh, of the pandemic. Yeah, so I, I, we can dismiss that one. So then the next one is, there were no foreign electoral observers and journalists. According to Ben Norton of the Gray Zone, there were 232 foreigners accredited from 27 countries, 165 to accompany the election and 67 at journalist. Notably missing was the New York Times. The lady who wrote the hit piece wasn't even there. Uh, let's listen to some of the clips of the testimony of the election observers that I found especially interesting. And I also felt a sense of relief that everything was happening so peacefully. Then when I saw what the New York Times and the Biden administration were reporting, um, that no one had come out to vote or that it was less than 20 percent voter turnout, I realized how important it was that we were there to witness the elections ourselves. The U.S.'s regime change operation has an infin infinite capacity to tell lies, and they are counting on people to not go to Nicaragua and see for themselves what is happening. There we saw no corporate media presence. Um, the ones that were reporting were either reporting from New York or Costa Rica. They were not in Nicaragua. But you, you can't let them fool you like that. You must all go. You must not only see this, uh, this beautiful process of building up the population and giving them more rights than they ever had before, rights that we don't have in the richest country in the world to free education through college, healthy food, free health care, good infrastructure, but you must go before the U.S. sanctions take too much of a goal and before the U.S. government makes it harder for us to go there, and you must go to support and accompany the people of Nicaragua. Um, one thing that we did not hear that I think is worth mentioning, our group and those people that I talked to, not one person mentioned Daniel Ortega by name. Now, what we see in the uh, international media, they keep using the term the Ortega Murillo regime. Um, they use this term and they talk about a dictatorship as if um, as if 
uh, what's happening in Nicaragua is um, solely about the person of Daniel Ortega. And why I think it's important to mention that nobody mentioned his name to us is because that's not the sense here. For the people of Nicaragua, their government, their policies, and their revolution are not Daniel Ortega. He is an important person, but they very much feel that they are, um, they have, are, they themselves are the government. They're making these policies. Um, the Nicaraguans talk about um, the people president um, with this government. And that really is a feeling that people have. We've heard again and again, I'm here today for my country, for my revolution, for my programs, our programs and our policies. Um, and here also the word uh, in Spanish that's used to talk about people who benefit from projects uh, is not beneficiaries. The word is protagonists um, because there is a real uh, focus on people um, taking control of their own lives and being a part of these policies and these programs that are happening. And you can feel that when you talk to people. Uh, and when I was there uh, interviewing people that were uh, voting, um, even sometimes I would just walk around the neighborhood and talk to, to just regular folks that were standing there or, or walking around. And when I asked them about how do they feel about the, the voting process in their country um, or how do they feel about the, the government, um, I kind of got I got some of the same type of the same results, which is one they know what it's like to, to live under a U.S. puppet or a neoliberal president. Um, a lot of them experienced the, what is known as the these are seis años robados, the 16 years that was robbed from 1999 to 2005. Um, so they saw all the social programs get um, uh, be taken away, and now they've seen the country kind of re, kind of start all over again. Um, so that was one of the main uh, uh, responses that I got. And then also another thing is, you know. What a lot of people were telling me was that, you know, the Daniel Ortega and, and the Sandinista party is, you know, one of the first parties and first people to actually care about the poor people in Nicaragua. Um, and, and you can see that in the support in the communities. Um, and that's kind of mainly, mainly the, the, the things that I had heard back. Uh, now, another thing, too, that I want to point out is that uh, the people in Shenandega is, you know, they know about the, the violence that is happening to their northern neighbors in Honduras and El Salvador, that the U.S. is not sanctioned or demonized, yet the people of Nicaragua who are defending their, uh, you know, their independence and their country are being sanctioned and they're going to suffer through these sanctions. Um, so yeah, so it's really important that we continue to, to build a solidarity. Thank you very much. I'm Camille Landry. I traveled to Nicaragua for the first time last week, and I want to say that I support the government and people of Nicaragua because its representative, their representative of a successful struggle for liberation against colonialism, neocolonialism, racism, neoliberalism, uh, which are all forces that affect lives throughout the world and especially the lives of African people. I want to specifically direct my comments today to my African people because solidarity between all African people is fundamental uh, requirement for our liberation. So I traveled along with Netva and Garrett and several other people to Bluefields. Now that's over 2,700 miles from where I live, but it felt like home to me. I traveled there to be an international observer of the national election. And as you know, as other speakers have said, the U.S. government has declared the Nicaraguan administration of Ortega to be illegitimate. Uh, Biden says that the national election was rigged and undemocratic and illicit. The ugly, ugly history of U.S. involvement in Nicaragua goes back hundreds of years. They actually mined the harbor of Bluefield in 1983 under the, uh, under the Reagan administration um, so that they could have their way with the country. So make a long story short, we climbed into a van to drive across the country on a brand new road to the Bluefields Autonomous Region on the Caribbean coast. It is the home of Nicaragua's Afro-descendiente people. 
This is a black community that's been in the country since slave ships dropped them off in the 17th century to work the banana fields and the timber operations, part of an extraction of Nicaragua's resources for its colonial masters. And this is another point of shared history. Our ancestors were kidnapped to enrich the colonial masters. By the way, Nicaragua has the largest population of Afro-descendantes in Central America, and approximately two-thirds of that group resides in and around the Bluefields region. So one of the first things I notice is that the port city of Bluefields looks and sounds and feels like any small Caribbean town that I've ever been in. The people speak an English patois, they eat rice and peas and oxtails, they drink rum, and they play reggae. Um, it was originally a British colony and is now part of Nicaragua, but it is an autonomous region. Bluefields and its people have had more than their share of neglect, of exploitation, racial bias among previous governments of Nicaragua. They've been exploited and underserved and ignored in a whole variety of ways. But with the advent of the Sandinista government, it was established as an autonomous region that grants local control to these twice colonized people. It's also, by the way, the home of the Mosquito people, the original, some of the original people of Nicaragua. And their communities also suffered under colonialism and due to the repeated attacks by the U.S. government. Um, the Mosquito and Afro-Descendiente people are in solidarity with each other, and those communities seem to mesh and mingle rather seamlessly. And this also reminded me of my home. I, I live in Oklahoma, where indigenous and African people were work side by side for our liberation. So while we were there, we took a boat ride, which is another story all to itself, about 40 miles north through a tidal estuary to Pearl Lagoon. And it's the home of a community of Afro-descendientes and a neighboring village of Mosquito people who are indigenous and a Mestizo settlement. They all share an elementary school that was built by the Ortega administration in a way to withstand storm, storm surges and heavy rains that are so common in that area. Prior to the Ortega administration, their school would, would wash away with storms that would become impassable and actually unsafe for children. They showed us that they now have electricity and clean water, and they have school books where people are able to learn their own history, as Garrett said, not just the national history, um, that they are able to see themselves reflected in the community. They talked about how before Ortega, one of the poll workers told us, we use phosphor lamps for light. They stink, and when you knock them over, they cause fires. They showed us the secondary school and told me that they have two different university centers that enable people to get degrees. And by the way, that's all free. And I might add that at my post-social security age, I'm still paying off student loans. So I can fully relate to that as a point of liberation. We met the uh, mayor, Daryl Taylor Fox, and he said, you know, we've got a road that goes to Managua now, but in order to get just to Bluefields by car, which is only about 35, 40 miles south, you have to drive clear across the country and come back to Bluefields. But our road is being extended. And for the first time in our history, we will be able to travel by land safely at any hour of the day or night, whatever the weather, to Bluefields, which is the, the center of our province. I saw a health clinic that had modern equipment that was free to all. And there were posters up all over the place promoting maternal fetal health, child health, mental health, general health. People can walk into the clinic, the mayor told me, and they can get good medical care for free. And before, if you got sick and you had no money, you just suffered or died. I can totally relate to that because I live in a community that has one of the lowest rates of health care in the United States, which is one of the most underserved areas, the most underserved areas of the first world, by the way. So I saw electricity, clean water, free education through university levels, schools for all, roads, health care, and a voice in the national and local government. 
That's what the people of Bluefields wanted and needed, and that's what they got under the Ortega administration. Do you wonder why they voted for it? So I say, yeah, that election was rigged. They rigged it by providing what people need, providing what people want, and then making certain that every person in Nicaragua had the opportunity to vote in their free choice in the election. And if that's an unfair election, well, I wish the elections in my place of, of living, in my community, in my nation, were that kind of rigged. Because right here in the U.S., we have voter suppression, we have gerrymandering, we have a hundred different ways in which the voices of people like me and you are not heard in the United States. So what I'm saying is that this is home to me. The struggles of the people of Nicaragua are right alongside the struggles of other African people throughout the world. The story of the Afro-Descendente people of Nicaragua is an age old story. It feels like home and I stand in total solidarity with all of the people of Nicaragua and with the Nicaraguan revolution. Okay, this is a, a single classroom. There were about 13,500 rooms like this across Nicaragua. And you'll see there that there are three people seated. Those are poll workers who don't work for any political party. And behind them, you see four individuals. In this case, there were four. There were always at least three people who observed from parties. He's signing in to vote. He's going to vote and then you know go through this process. These are the people who actually count the votes. And I said there's 13,500 more or less of these in Nicaragua. It's sometimes a school has more than one room that's used. But they're counting votes ranging on average about 200 votes each. And then they're reporting those results transparently up through the system, all of the observers present all the time. And then the ballots are transferred by all of them in a bus to the more central locations for verification. So in order for them to hack this election, they would have to get all of these people to conspire and lie and say that they made up votes. And they're from different political parties and not just in this one room because they only control about 200 votes. They would have to do this thousands of times across the country. So it would be a conspiracy literally of hundreds of thousands of people. And I consider a conspiracy of hundreds of thousands of people to get it to look like one party won an election is basically just democracy. People voted, it, it's very, very clear. And this notion that this election was rigged is so ridiculous if you were there on the ground. Another issue is you saw lines and we did see lines because a lot of people showed up very early to vote even before they opened. And so there were lines and those lines went down very fast because they handled people so quickly about two a minute for one of those rooms. They, have, they don't have that many people assigned to a room. So it goes really fast, but you know, I would say that by, you know, 10 o'clock, uh, we had seen probably almost half the population that was due to a place to vote, already seen them with our eyes. So the idea that 10 or 20 percent of people voted is also ridiculous. People were voting early and there was huge crowds that could not be explained by, you know, people staying home. So those lies that were that were pr propagated in the U.S. press are very obviously false. Now we didn't. We didn't ask. Where, my group didn't ask people who they voted for. We asked them what brought you out to vote. And what I thought was really interesting is that they said they came out to vote um, for things that had been done. They didn't come out. They didn't say, "Oh, because I saw on Facebook, you know, so and so, you know, I liked his picture." They didn't say, "Oh, because uh, I read in the paper or because of the promises." No, it was all things that had happened. They would tell us. You know, we were hit by two category five hurricanes. I don't think they said category five, but I know that they were. They were hit by two hurricanes last year. The government saved our lives. They came in, they brought, they re, they replaced the roofs on our homes. They rebuilt our schools. You know, those are the things that, that they were out to vote for. And so you can kind of guess that they liked the government. They were probably going to vote for the incumbents. Um, <clears throat> now, in addition to that, uh, one person told us that before the Sandinista party uh, obtained power, in Nicaragua, they had one kilometer of paved road in their entire region. And now they have 500 kilometers. And just like Bluefields, now we're in the north uh, west or northeast corner, uh, as far as you can get from Managua and still be in Nicaragua. You know, in this area, they had 500 kilometers of paved road and they needed 70 more 
kilometers to be paved so that they could drive paved road all the way to Managua. They said it took them 15 days. Now it takes them 15 hours. It'll soon be a little bit shorter. So those are the things that were driving them. It wasn't uh, it wasn't like our elections. It wasn't the media, which generally a lot of the media was very, very negative against the, the Nicaraguan government because it's foreign media that operates in Nicaragua. So that's what I saw. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so this was from the Alliance for Global Justice webinar, Nicaragua Elections Report Back, featuring on the ground electoral observers, recorded November 20th. So they must mean there were no election observers from the OAS. <laughs> Why did the government <clears throat> ban the OAS from monitoring the election? Well, they, they know they know how OAS, <clears throat> excuse me, is a mouthpiece for the U.S. and how they how they basically worked to get rid of um, Morena in, in Bolivia in 2019, in which they said the election wasn't wasn't fair or had some improprieties. And that set the right wing off in Bolivia, of course, set up by the US. Um, he had to fly out on, I think, November 10th or November 11th, 2019. And now we find out that there was even a plan to assassinate uh, him on the plane right after it took off. I mean, this is how threatening um, a true democratic leader is to the United States. Um, Evo Morales. Evo, Evo Morales, that's who I'm trying to think of, Evo Morales. So the United States tipped their hand a little too much in that one, and Nicaragua said, you're not welcome in for our election in 2021. And of course, the OAS, which was formed in 1948 as a mechanism to counter communism in, in Latin America, has always been a mouthpiece for the U.S. Um, foreign policy. And U.S. pays 60 percent of its uh, budget. So, you know, that says something right there. Uh, and its current executive director, uh, Milagro, I think his name is. He's he's horrible. He's he's just he's he just talks to Blinken and says whatever Blinken tells him to to do. I mean, now, the Sandinistas <clears throat> were frustrated with OAS for a long time, but finally they did the right thing. They said we don't want to be OAS here, and we want to withdraw ourselves from the OAS process, which actually takes a couple of years to formally do that, but they've announced that they're not part of OAS. Um, you know, I think it's important to point out that the uh, OAS had uh, election observers in Nicaragua in 2015. And, yeah, 2016. And I was one, I was an election observer also then. Uh, and they said that election was relatively fair. Yeah. And, and uh, before that, it was the Carter Center in 2011. Right, right. right. So and the Carter Center is funded by the National Endowment for Democracy. So uh, you can't trust the Carter Center either, even though in Nicaragua, they make great efforts to have the, the mechanical process of election to be very transparent and fair. It's hard to it's hard to critique it because they they do such a good job in constructing a fair election. Um, but I know that even the Carter Center, which monitored the uh, Haiti election with uh, Aristide in 19, uh, 19, let's see, 1990. Uh, I met with Aristide after he was took office in 1991. And he said the Carter Center came to him the night before the, the election in Haiti. I think it was two of the leaders of the, of the uh, Carter Center, uh, forgot the guy's name, Bob, Robert Parsons, maybe, came to him and said, we just came from the U.S. Embassy and they have information that you're going to lose the election, even though Aristide is very popular. He hadn't been elected yet, but he was extremely popular. And Aristide said, there's no way that those polls that the U.S. is citing are correct. And he refused. He said, 
I'm not going to go on Haitian TV and say I'm no longer a candidate. This is the night before the election. But the U.S. said if he lost, there would be rioting in the streets. And to save the rioting, to save the Haitians from the rioting, it would be better if he re announced he was withdrawing from the presidency the night before the election. So, of course, the Carter Center was funded by the National Endowment for Democracy. A CIA uh, cutout. Yeah, I see. I totally, totally. So you can't trust, you really can't trust hardly anybody or anything anymore if uh, they have, well, you have to look at where their money's from. And usually if you have a big operation, you need a lot of money. That's yeah. one reason I've stayed very independent and, and uh, I don't have any, well, I don't, I don't have any institution. I, I don't have any staff. I don't, I'm just, one person who's trying to survive my, with my dignity until I die, but I I can't even trust the church. Yeah, but see, the point is that you know those other elections were certified and the the results were virtually the same. You know, right, so exactly. the Sandinistas won overwhelmingly. You know, yeah. either in the you know uh, high sixty percent or the you know, up to, you know, 75%, right? Yeah. So, well, know, Almagro has become increasingly belligerent about Nicaragua since 2016. Uh, I'm sure he's he's been paid off by the U.S. handsomely um, to become much more of a mouthpiece for the U.S. rather than a, rather than a, and OA, a true OAS directors for all all Latin America, but I think OAS days are numbered. Period. Um, they're just too they're just too partisan in support of the U.S. policies of of privatization. So they're just a neoliberal extension of the U.S. State Department. Yeah, the voter turnout was negligible. <laughs> well, that's a joke. Where's that coming from? <laughs> That's coming from money going to right wingers to write it down, then gets reproduced with a mouse on on the internet uh, thousands of times. Um, yeah, I mean the turnout was uh, was actually a, quite high. I mean it was kind of in the right range of all the turnouts of the last three elections, but it was yeah. definitely um, it was definitely a high turnout compared to the U.S. Uh, and 65% of the eligible voters voted. The eligible voters, not registered voters, eligible voters voted. So um, that's quite a high percentage. And of those 75%, 76% voted for the FSLN. When people say, well, there was no serious opposition. And I say, well, the opposition supports neoliberalism and privatization. The people don't want it. And there's no other party that's talking about um, Helping increasing the, the increasing the the, the uh, funds for the health department and the education department and um, so forth. I mean, the, the, it's either voting for the opposition, which supports neoliberalism and privatization. Are voting for some version of socialism or a mixed economy like the Santa Nises have, where the excess funds or most of the funds go into programs for the people. It's it's very obvious. It's not complicated. It's very simple. Yeah. So that that brings us to the number one accusation, and that is that the the government banned the opposition parties and imprisoned opposition candidates. This is the uh, big kahuna and the one that had me going until I looked into it. It's also one that opens the big can of worms. None of the people arrested were actually registered as candidates. The figures oh. who were detained have been variously described in the international media as pre-candidates or possible challengers uh, because they're the richest, you know, uh, uh, Christina tomorrow is the richest uh, the kind of the richest family in in Nicaragua, so of course she has to be a candidate, yeah. you know. But uh, 
but yeah. she wasn't officially a candidate because yeah. there's a very specific process by which parties are announced before the election and their candidates are identified. And that hadn't happened yet. Yeah. Uh, and, and I'm the sure that the U.S. had already preordained her as the Guaido of Nicaragua, and they knew they were going to lose the election, and then they would proclaim Christiana Shimoto as the pre as the president the U.S. acknowledges, and the European Union would go along with it. And guess what? The Sandinistas were smart enough to know that all these people, including Christiana Shimoto, and all these heads of NGOs and other prominent people in Nicaragua had all been part of the coup in 2018. They had all accepted millions of dollars to destabilize Nicaragua. And they had a, they have quite an, quite a sophisticated intelligence network since the coup of 2018 caught them a little bit off guard. So they have really beefed up their uh, eyes and ears about uh, anything that looks like another coup attempt. And there definitely was a coup, going to be a coup uh, in the summer of this year before the election. But they also, they also were convicted, they were also charged with money laundering because they had received a lot of money from the NED and the USAID uh, for specific purposes that were in conflict with the stated purposes of for which that money was supposedly allocated. In other words, these NGOs were spending the money on destabilizing Nicaragua rather than teaching democracy to the students. And that has been perhaps one of the United States most successful propaganda campaigns. And when I saw all these people getting arrested in, uh, in June of this year, I called up uh, the leader of this peasant women's group and I said, what do you think about all these people getting jailed? She said, thank God they're behind bars so that they can't um, impose that violence on us again that they did in 2018. And um, this is, there was a lot of tension. We had the rain document that was leaked from the US embassy in July of 2020, saying that there was a new USAID regime change plot that was around the elections that had uh, different scenarios. Um, and, um, and the also we had the people who were some of the masterminds behind the violence of 2018, that these are the ones who got arrested. There was a, an amnesty in 2019. So everybody who, who whether they had been prosecuted or not, um, benefited from an amnesty, but the condition was to not repeat the crime. Now, so there, the, the Nicaraguan authorities say that there was evidence that these people who were arrested in June um, were involved in, in another coup plot. But we should also say that the Nicaraguan uh, people, and it's all, we always hear Danielle Ortega, and I think some of the other people here have done a good job of pointing out how, you know, in the US, it's all, our politics is all about personalities. What we saw in Nicaraguan voters, their elections are all about voting for policies. But at any rate, um, uh, the, um, the Nicaraguan people, not Daniel Ortega, the Nicaraguan institutions, their, um, their National Assembly, enacted laws um, that protected their, their country from violence from other countries and from uh, outside governments in meddling in their political process. And that's when they passed the, the law that required NGOs that receive money from abroad to account for that money and make sure that it's being used what it's supposed to be used for, not for political activity, and they have to show their books. And um, there is also a law to protect their sovereignty. And anyone who knows what um, US sanctions have done to the people of Cuba and Iran and Venezuela and so many other countries can understand that the Nicaraguan legislature would want to make it illegal to publicly um, call for sanctions to be imposed on your own country. So people that were arrested in, two, in earlier this year, it was for violating these laws. And, um, but 
they had they had this tactic of calling themselves pre-candidates as they were going to get um, arrested. And as Cristiana Chamorro, who who was uh, filtering money to um, from U.S. government agencies to different entities in Nicaragua, as she was not willing to account for the money, then she declared herself. She, she saw that the that she was getting close to being prosecuted. She declared herself, well, I'm a pre-candidate. And they invented this term pre-candidate. And the, the, the people that were arrested were not even registered with a political party, much less a candidate or this fictitious pre-candidate. And I think that the proof is in the pudding. The Nicaraguan people did not believe that USAID, NED, State Department line that Daniel Ortega had jailed all of his rivals. If they had believed it, they wouldn't have come out to vote. Voting is not mandatory in Nicaragua. And uh, people turned up at the polls. Um, I, you know, I might have family in Nicaragua and some of them keep in touch with people who follow opposition media. The opposition wanted people to not go to the polls. It didn't work for them. And so the New York Times and this Biden administration are acting like what they wanted to happen happened. It didn't happen. People went and voted and the United States didn't like the way they voted. Thank you. Americans really don't know about this coup attempt that happened in, in 2018. But yeah, no, no, I, wanna, no, no. I wanna get into that, but uh, you know, the reason why that they were charged is because there was an amnesty agreement. And, uh, and so I don't understand why they gave all these people amnesty in the first place, but you know, that definitely what they did was illegal. And they, they, then again, they violated the amnesty agreement, you know? Yeah. The amnesty agreement was basically a, a capitulation to the pressure from the U S so that Nicaragua wasn't going to be accused of having all these quote unquote political prisoners, uh, which there would be, there might have been a couple hundred. Uh, and the amnesty was basically a kind of a shocking political decision that President Ortega made to, to hopefully shut the US up. Uh, but it did, it did, it was conditioned on not committing any further crimes or any other crimes. And that if they were arrested for other crimes, the original crime would also be reinstated in addition to the new crime that they were charged with. So they were charged with basically treason, laundering money, um, and um, actually several of the members had gone to Congress before they were arrested asking Congress to pass the Rennes Air Act. Yeah. Which is, you know, just in, and one of those members came back with a suitcase full of a uh, hundred dollar bills. I think it was um, almost a million dollars in the suitcase that the, uh, and he was a very well-known political figure from the past and on the right. And uh, his name was Cruz. Uh, so he's, he's also one of those in jail, but he'd been very involved in the 2018 coup. It was a vicious coup. Uh, it was, um, if I felt to me like a satanic cult had taken over uh, the opposition and all the thugs that were being paid 500 cordobas a day, they were burning people alive. They were torturing people with, with, with priests being in, conducting the torture. And they cell phoned everything. They picked, they quoted everything from their cell phones, proud that they were going to get away with this and the u.s was going to protect them and they would put all this on on the internet which i saw on the internet as other nicaraguans did to tell the nicaraguans you better comply with with uh with what we're saying to get rid of the sandinistas or you're going to get your house burned or you're going to get murdered or i mean it was a terror campaign uh like well i'd never quite experienced anything personally like that. I mean, in Vietnam was a total terror campaign, but uh, we called it a war. And this certainly was a war too uh, in 2018. But um, if you were here, living here at the time, 
it was a it was a terrifying time, and I wasn't going to leave. It didn't matter what was what was going to happen. I was not going to leave the country. And in fact, I was gonna, if I was just recovering from surgery, and if I'd been a little bit healthier, I would have been out in the streets confronting them with no guns, just with my hands out stretched and say, "What the hell are you people doing? Burning down buildings, burning down Sandinista government buildings, banks." Um, uh, universities, uh, grade schools, elementary schools, damaging hospitals. Uh, I mean, it was pure satanic. I, I mean, I call it satanic. It's like, it's crazy. And well, uh, 200 people died. And, at uh, least 200. I mean, there were, there were 403 policemen shot. And of those, 23 died. And... Um, I kept track. I have a, a log book. I've kept track of all the fatalities that I could find in uh, the Nicaragua media or friends were telling me who, who was killed. And actually there was more like 300 that were killed. Um, and some of those that were killed were not even recorded because they were uh, historical combatants that were working as volunteers uh, to get rid of the the roadblocks of which there were about 1300 roadblocks that the opposition had created with these thugs all over Nicaragua. So it really stymied any kind of travel. Finally, in July, uh, the, the, the police were given the job of clearing out the trunk case, but they were helped by quote unquote volunteer police, volunteer police, which were historical combatants, 20 of whom died in that process. Preserving yeah, so the revolution. You write a leaked USAID memo in the summer of 2020 revealed up to date brazen US plans called Responsive Assistance in Nicaragua, RAIN, yeah. to overthrow the Nicaraguan government by destroying public order and other violent actions. That's supposed to be in quotes. Yeah. That will include, quote, network monitoring to create fake news, unquote. Would you elaborate a little more on you on this? And uh, you know, this this is a, actually they're trying to privatize this, right? They're trying yeah. to yeah, of course. And uh, you know, find find people, uh, uh, you know, uh, overthrow the government for us. We'll pay you well, you know. Right. <laughs> and and uh, because the economics is hard in Nicaragua, a lot of people are are suffering from lack of sufficient funds. Uh, this was an opportunity to make a lot of money. I mean, 500 cordobas a day in Nicaragua was a lot of money. It's about $15 a day. Um, so for a, for a thug who's on the street, it's easy money. All you yeah. have to do is take an AK-47 that they give you, and you stand with a bunch of other people with AK-47s, and they give you the prostitutes. You're there 24 hours a day. Um, and everybody's uh, pretty scared to, to travel on the roads. I had to travel on the roads uh, out of necessity. And fortunately, my driver, although we, had, we did go through one, one blockade that let us through, uh, fortunately, um, but my driver knew how to evade the other blockades by going on really, really back roads to back roads. Uh, and even driveways, you'd say, um, and fields uh, to avoid um, uh, these blockades because they actually stopped ambulances. People died in ambulances trying to get to the hospital. The Tronkays wouldn't let the ambulances through. I mean, it was, in, it was um, I think only people in the, only people in the U.S. would even think of doing these things. I don't know. I mean, maybe this has happened in other parts of the world in history, but it was really demonic. And I was glad in a way to be experiencing it because I, it would be hard to believe if I hadn't experienced a little bit of it. I had to, uh, we built a, a, a barricade in front of our house because there were thugs coming through town in pickup trucks in black uniforms with AK-47 shooting up neighborhoods. So we actually, our street built a barricade to stop the, these 
pickup trucks from coming through our neighborhood. It was yeah. so that was a tronche that we built ourselves. Tronche is a word for, for roadblock. There are some some other aspects of this that are really scary, and that is that uh, you know the U.S. You know, uh, this disinformation thing extends to social media, right? And the U.S. is using disinformation warfare you know, called DARPA and SMISC. The Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, they've just spent a lot of work on using the Internet for uh, basically destabilizing countries. Yeah, and, I read and, the identi and identifying the other people who are on the internet trying to save the country so they're able to neutralize the critics as they promote the u.s line yeah so facebook which is called meta now you know canceled a thousand accounts right. like including, that, within the first couple of weeks huh including mine <laughs> so well at any rate uh, it looks like they got their work cut out for them because the thing is that Chile just elected a social uh, Democrat, Gabriel Boric, this uh, last week, and El Alberto Fernandez, a leftist, was elected in Argentina in 2019. Uh, Luis Arce, Evo Morales' Minister of Finance, became president of Bolivia, so all that work they did to get rid of the progressives in Bolivia didn't work out so good. And... Uh, Pedro Castillo, a Marxist, became president of Peru this year. And Ex uh, Exio Mara Castro, wife of Manuel Zelaya, just Zelaya. got elected president of Honduras. The U.S. is pretty worried. I know that they they convinced the Peru, the new Peru, Peru president, president to not uphold, not honor the Nicaraguan election results. And that had to be because the U.S. was threatening Peru with loss of money or... Uh, and actually, there's a lot of a lot of rumors that he's going to be assassinated in Peru by the right wing. At any rate, uh, thanks again, Brian. Yeah. Th thanks for the opportunity. I, I hope a lot of people see your program. And do you have any way of knowing how many people watch uh, pirate TV? There's no, uh, uh, you know, uh, ratings or anything for free speech TV. But yeah. You know, a lot, you know, it's national, it's global, actually, you know, because yeah. multimedia goes on. Well, I've had people contact me saying that they had uh, seen that first interview. Yeah. Uh, we had. So, well, I mean, we're doing what we can. Well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, until our last breath. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, well, we'll do it again soon, Brian. Okay. Thanks a lot. All right. Thanks a lot.